Rebecca Bromogen, this is a thrill for me. Back at you, buddy. <laughs> so, what's it feel like to be the second most important person in the history of the town of Minor since Tommy Leach? <laughs> Tommy Leach. Well, actually, there, you know, we we did have um, uh, Nuttall, who mm -hmm. was. Um, like the head of the board of supervisors for the county. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was much more important than me, so. You, you've been the supervisor of the town of Minor for how long? I'm in my 24th year. Does that make you the longest serving supervisor? Um, I've been told perhaps that is the case, but I'm not sure. I know Martha Bills is like in 20 years or something like that, so I might be the longest one in the county right now. Before we get into you, just curious, what caused you to want to be involved in the public electoral world? Well, back in 1976 and 77, I was town clerk, and it was part of just wanting to learn a little ah. bit about that. But um, one day, my husband and I were riding along in his truck, and one of the older gentlemen in town pulled, waved us over, and rolled down the windows, we were chatting with him, Slaney Walford, you know Bruce Walford. Sure. It's his father. He pulled us over, and uh, he was on Dennis's side of the truck, and he said, I need to talk to you. And it's like, me? Oh, sure, what do you need to talk to me about? He goes, you have been feeding from the public trough way too long. <laughs> there is an opening on town board, and you need to be on town board. I'm like, I, I don't think I need to be on town board. Well, Dennis had just done the commencement speech for Sherman School a couple of weeks before that, at which time he talked about how we needed to step up and do more for our community ah. and community service. So we talked about it, and I said to Slaney, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And then Slaney, you know, all those years, he would always say, this was the best decision I ever made in my life was getting her involved in town politics. So that was the beginning. That was the beginning. So I was on town board for like two and a half years before I became town supervisor, and you know how I am. There was like no agenda, and <laughs> it wasn't the structure that we needed to have. So I went home and said to Dennis, I either have to get off town board or I have to become town supervisor because it, it's not working out. So I ran against the incumbent, and then since then no one's run against it's me. <laughs> so. And I plan on running, my term is up in December, and I do plan on running for another four years. And then So this is the a, announcement tonight? This is the big announcement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so there we go. Uh, where are you from? Where, where is hometown? Finley Lake, New York. That's my hometown. What would what, your dad do for a living? He was a welder at GE. Okay. And my, both of my parents were from Elgin, Pennsylvania, which is near Union City, Wattsburg, Quarry. And when he got a job at GE, he said he did not want to live on the west side of town because he didn't want to drive into the sun on the way and drive into the sun on the way home. So they found a place east of GE and they liked Finley Lake. So they moved there a month before I was born. Hmm. So that's your, your, uh, I'm native. You yeah. are as native as they get. Yeah. And your dad being a GE, did your dad know Dennis? Was oh, it? yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, in a sense Dennis of before was... Dennis became your husband? Yes. Well, Dennis was from French Creek, which is, of course, where Peak and Peak is. Yeah. He was raised on a farm there. Okay. You can't, like, not know everybody, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, he did. Not, not well, but knew him a little bit, yeah. sure. Did Dennis work at GE? He did. Yeah, he was an industrial engineer. He was manager of plant engineering and maintenance and construction. So how does your career path... Well, first of all, a little bit of background, I suppose, as far as college. Where'd you go to college? Yeah. Where, where, where'd I where? go? Uh, Two-year degree, JCC, four-year degree, SUNY Fredonia, master's, MBA from Gannon University, and you know, I went back to school at UB for UB. a master's in sociology, which I haven't finished. I did all the coursework, but guess what? That thesis isn't done yet, <laughs> so. What's, what's the title of the thesis? Oh, well, you, it's nice if you can actually narrow that down, but 
basically what I'm interested in are adverse childhood experiences. And so that's one topic that I have written a lot of papers on. The other is I'm very interested in bullying because in New York State, even though there is the anti-bullying in school laws, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that almost all of the schools across the state report zero bullying incidents per year. Mm. Even though about 35% of children in school students say that they've been bullied. So the putting the law in place and then implementing it, there's it's kind of lacked its effectiveness in that regard. So that's one of the things I'm interested in. But is that on your to-do list? Yeah, oh sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if we get the if we get to that. So our paths cross uh, down at the Achievement Center, I guess it was called then. It was. It was yeah. called the Achievement. ARC. It was ARC, ARC yeah. but it was um, a, what was in the back, the industrial part of it, was the Jamestown Achievement Center. Of course, there was the Dunkirk Achievement Center and the Westfield Achievement right. Center. But at Jones and Gifford, in the front part of that, that was called, what, Chautauqua County Association for Retarded Children. 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 Yeah. So you came in, how did you get even, how did you even know it existed? I didn't know it existed. Yeah. So I was, when I graduated from Fredonia um, with a degree in accounting, um, <clears throat> I sat for the CPA exam and passed it. And so it was my goal to be a, work for a CPA firm. So I interviewed, and back then, questions like, how is your marriage? What are you going to do about your children? How are you going to travel all the way from Finley Lake to either Jamestown or Erie when I was interviewing? And even though I did very well in school and passed the exam, I couldn't get hired. So um, I went, ended up at JBC teaching for two years, and accounting subjects. And then one day, Bob Halstead, who mm -hmm. was a partner in Halstead Corey, one of the firms I had interviewed at, um, called me and said, I have been keeping track of you. I think that's probably through Tyler Swanson because he was the right. dean of JBC then. And I hear you're doing very well, and I wondered if you would interview for a social service agency, a large social service agency. And I said, well, no, I don't really want to do that. I really want to work for a CPA firm. And he said, would you please at least go to the interview, and I will go with you. And I said, well, okay. So Bob Halstead met me at the door, mm. and we went in together, and they started talking about what the needs are, and Michael Raymond, of course, was there, just the three of us, and he kept pulling on his beard and saying to me, when can you start, when can you start? I said, I, I don't know that I want to do this job. I, I really sh probably shouldn't even be here, but he says, but when can you start? And I said, I'm gonna need some time to think about whether I want to do this or not. So I said, I need a couple weeks to think about it. So I went home, thought about it, and I thought, well, I'm not getting any offers from CPA firms. So why not? So that's how it worked. And after I was there about two months, I got a phone call from a CPA firm who wanted to hire me. Uh. And I said, well, I can't do that. I've already made a commitment here. I can't just leave after two months. So 10 years later, <laughs> I was still there. So. Well, you were there during the go-go years. Uh, yeah. Mike we Raymond uh, became the executive director in 1974. I was uh, uh, co-opted uh, in 19, early 1977. Uh, Sherry Cadwell of my office, who was my mentor, who was one of the original incorporators, said, so Greg, you need, to, you need to run with this guy because I can't. <laughs> and that was the beginning of that aspect of yeah. it. And as a result, uh, Rebecca Brumbagen became part of that orbit. In 1979. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, what was your sense at the time of the, we'll just use the term resource center because that's named yeah. over time, but um, what was your sense at that time in 1979, you know, as you got the job, your first job, uh, you know, uh, and you're working with Mike Raymond, you're working with developmentally disabled people, you're, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. It was very different for me. Um, prior to that, I always thought that accounting was hard. And I always thought, 
you know, when I got in there, am I going to be able to set up the accounts payable system the way it should be? Or with the accounts receivable system? And then I found out that's actually the easy part of the job. Um, the most difficult part of the job for me was communicating with department heads about why changes fiscally or accounting wise were important. Um, because as far as they were concerned, I remember Mary Andrews, mm -hmm. um, when I wanted to consolidate the billing for Dunkirk into Jamestown, or yeah, Dunkirk, into Jamestown, she was like, that's bad business. That's bad business. So I was like, how could people not see that these very basic fundamental accounting things aren't really good for the organization? So that was a little bit of a challenge for me. Because I had never really been around people with intellectual disabilities, I was, I really wasn't familiar, didn't really know what to expect, but I really came to love, um, to love that. And I think that's why I went on wanting to be an executive director of an agency that helps children with emotional behavioral problems, physical disabilities, um, developmental delays, was because I had that. I think that actually changed my life tremendously from being only a person who thinks about things like accounting, <laughs> which I loved. Um, I don't really love it so much anymore, but what I did love, to a person who really got to see how um, a skill like accounting can help uh, other people. So it was really tremendous for me to have that opportunity. Willowbrook decree had already been in decree, yeah. and Mike and uh, the staff, of which you were a part, uh, yes. were very quick and responsive to what was really a void in the state as to how to provide... Uh, Community-based services, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And what do you remember about kind of those thought processes? Because we seem to be on the cutting edge, we even in the, the state. Edge. You know, one of the things about Michael is that... Um, which probably has been said by everyone, that he was a visionary in terms of he cared very, very deeply for the clients. And so it meant a great deal to him to be able to take them out of institutions. My recollection of what he shared with me about his background educationally was that he had worked in some developmental centers mm -hmm. and that he really felt a need to help people get out of those environments. And so he was at the forefront. Um, he was, as far as I know, probably the agency director who was the most willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. And when you see how that uh, developed and developed very quickly, when we took the very medically fragile clients out of flowers hospital in Manhattan mm -hmm. and brought them to Chautauqua County, no one else would do that. No other executive director in the state would have ever done that. Uh, it was just such a risky venture, yet so successful because he was so willing to put himself and the organization out to do that. And as a result, the state, and I always get confused as to which agency did it, mm -hmm. but they provided lots of funding because there was that immediacy of the Willowbrook decree. Yes, that had to follow the clients their yeah. entire lives. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, funds came, uh, homes were being built. Uh, I always thought about you and trying to keep track of Mike, who's at 10,000 feet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I trying to follow right behind him, try to dot an I or cross a T yeah. occasionally. Uh, and then you, who's got to reconcile with the state. Yeah. How did that work? Actually, it worked very well. And one of the reasons why it worked well is because Michael had no interest in accounting. He just, he wanted things to happen. And I loved accounting. <laughs> and so it didn't matter what the cost reports were or what the funding streams were. It was always a challenge. And... Um, and I would just tell him, this is what we've got, this is what we're working with, this, and he never really challenged me about that. He was, just, he was very accepting 
of whatever it was I told him in terms of financial and accounting. Well, that my again, my impression from a little bit of a far, but was the two of you worked very well together because he did not have an interest in it. Right. And you just wanted to make sure he didn't get too far ahead of his skis. Yes. Well, I actually had a couple of department heads say to me one time, because you will know that Michael didn't actually like to ever be told no. So he didn't like it if he had an idea and people would just say, oh, I'm not saying that. that he had the way of looking straight through you. You remember that, don't I do. you? Yeah. yeah, looking straight through you, and then you knew, oh, I don't think he likes that. So one of the ways I was able to combat that was that if Michael had an idea, and I would think to myself, uh-oh, I'm not thinking that's such a great idea, I would just say to him, I'll take a look at that. And then I would go and I would do the analysis on it and think this is a disaster. And then I would do, I knew what the objective was, so then I would come up with a different way of meeting that objective. And then I would take it back to him and I would say, Michael, I did the analysis on this. And what, my, what I'm concerned about is here's the pros of that, here's the cons. I was thinking about some other way of doing what you'd like. What do you think about this? The pros of that would be this, and I don't think there would be as many cons. What do you think? He always said, yeah, do it that way. Yeah. But if I would have said, this won't work, Michael, <laughs> it would be like he would just look through me and we wouldn't have had the great relationship that we did. And, and you did, and mm -hmm. that's, a, that, that's probably a, a good lesson for everybody. <laughs> Because Mike didn't want to, Mike, Mike tried to get yes all the time, and I, having drive, driven around in his car quite a bit many times, where which was loaded with pop cans, you know, <laughs> you know, what a mess. Um, but his, his brain was going 24-7. It was going 24-7, yeah. And um, so at least I knew to respect that because I knew where he was coming from was a good place. It's just that I felt the way he had conceptualized how to do that financially, um, he just wasn't able maybe to understand that there could be some other ways to look at something. Willow Trace, the Willow Trace project was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Kerry came here, uh, and it was during that time period, construction of a community residence on Forest Avenue, Willow Avenue, Benedict Avenue, yeah. uh, swimming pools, yeah. we had lifts, yeah. and you probably went up there and used that lift. Nope. nope. <laughs> but, you know, this is all kind of that 81, 82 time period. There's a pharmacy that was created. Uh, we moved to the Caprino's Furniture Building in 83, yeah. as, the, as I'm sure you did. That's where your offices yes. were there. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And Arthur Grand. I mean, think about that short period of time, you know, Mike was having us buy a lot of real estate. Yes, he was. Yeah, and so what did that do on your accounting end? And all of a sudden you got worrying about reimbursement and budgets because all of that's dependent on getting money from the state to justify acquisition yeah. and or lease. Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, you probably have a sense for the fact that I'm a person who thrives on a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, I don't mind how much work is thrown at me. And I like to dig down into the detail of how something works and then build on that. So as far as I'm concerned, none of those projects was a stressor for me. Um, they were all just projects that needed to be taken care of, and I learned a lot from them. Um, so, yeah, I, I really, it was more a stressor on my staff than it was on me. The department had you work with closely. Who were some, name names? Cindy Philgate, Cindy. you'll remember her. I do. Bruce Piatz, of course. Um, Joe DiCarlo, mm -hmm. Clark Poppleton, Paul Chizana, when he was a department head. Um, Pam Cleary. Um, those are the ones that are coming to mind. Later on, Gail Donis. Um, did I say Clark Poppleton already? You did? Yep, I yep. thought I did, yes. Um, Tom did Tisdale. He? Pardon? Tom Tisdale. Tom Tisdale. Yeah. Who, in turn, went out with Mike when he went to Connecticut. He did, yes. Yeah. Um, Sam Restivo. And Sam. Yes, he was the interim f executive director for a period of time. After he was HR director for a little bit and then became the interim director. And he went between right. Mike and Paul. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So during that, that whole go-go time period, were you caught up at all in the HR aspect of that? In the HR aspect we, well, of Well, in the, what? as far as employee, perks, benefits, no. Did, you know, I know we didn't have, we didn't have a union then, but it was, yeah. uh, it just, who no. did all that stuff? Is that Cindy? I don't remember who did HR before Sam. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's not coming to me. So what were some of the speed bumps and challenges? I mean, you're there making sure the books balance mm -hmm. and the state is satisfied mm -hmm. and we make sure we get our reimbursements, which were always kind of a, a year behind and yeah. you had to have adjustments. And it was, yeah. anybody on the board, including myself, you'd look at that and say, essentially, when you gave a report, Rebecca, you'd say, are we okay? <laughs> I mean, that's what you relied on was yeah, that, because sure. you didn't understand it, honestly. Yeah. Well, I think some of the challenges of the position were the fact that because Michael, his personality plus his drive, he was kind of out there in terms of the state. And there were concerns that were raised about whether things were being done appropriately. And um, so um, I remember one time we actually had three different state departments there auditing us at the same time. And they would want to look at a document and I would say, to, they were in the big conference room, so one group was down at one end, one group in the middle, one group on the other end. And they'd say, we need, one group would say, we need this. And I'd say, okay, when, I'd sit, point at the other auditors and say, when you're done with that, would you pass that over <laughs> to them? Um, because so much was happening so quickly, I think that there was some concern that perhaps it wasn't being done properly. But um, in the end, it always was, and it was always fine, and we never had any uh, major audit things. Did you get involved in the, uh, uh, it, it, because there were so many state agencies mm -hmm. where you had to get involved with the politics of it all, where you had to deal aside from just the auditors, those are the professional hired guns by the state where you had to kind of talk to commissioners or, did, was that a, a part of your job description? No, really, I think Michael handled all of that. That was his forte. Yeah. He handled all that and the next thing you know, uh, he just told me, uh, we got this happening. And I'm like, alrighty then, we'll do it. So. You came to board meetings, occasionally. Uh, finance committee meetings, obviously. Okay. And who was the head of the finance committee during that time period? Do you remember who the? Well, who Len York for one part of it, um, but that was I think a little bit later. I'm just trying to think of who some of the members were. Um, Wilbur Dennison. Wilbur Dennison, yeah. Um, I think Elmer was. Also Elmer Minch. Minch was part of it, um, but Wilbur I remember the most because. You know the lunches got a little boring as far as I was concerned, so I decided to order. Chinese food, and I decided to order hot and sour soup, and he came in, and you know, he didn't have a lot of hair, and when he was eating the hot and sour soup, his face just got beet red, his head got beet <laughs> red, and he was dripping, and I'm saying, oh, I'm so sorry <laughs> that we ordered this food for you. So that's why I remember he was on finance. I don't really remember that many more people on finance. And with Len York, I remember him as, as treasurer, and of course he had an accounting background, which was always yeah. helpful. During that time period that you were the uh, involved, uh, the mm -hmm. presidents included Elmer, yep. uh, Joe Trusso, yep. Wilbur, mm -hmm. and uh, probably Tony and Grail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And among the, um, Joe Caprino, did your paths intersperse with the Joes much? No. A little bit. A little bit? A little bit, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Kay Neri. Oh, lovely woman. And uh, she and I, well, she was a spark in her own sense, you know. She, um, very protective, obviously, of Michael. Uh, she and I developed a, a nice, strong friendship. And, um, you know, she, I th again, she would be very protective of Michael. She was very organized. Um, she was a no BS kind of person, you know. Like, don't try to, you know, BS her about anything. So... Uh Frida Eddy. Oh, Frida. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, she was there when I very, very first started, and I don't think she was around very long, uh, but she was just a very sweet soul, and um, 
I don't know if she had one or two children, maybe, that were in the program. But um, yeah, that's all I remember is that she was very lovely and sweet. And I think she shared with me that her husband was uh, part of the group of people who uh, were involved in the centralization of the school districts for Clymer Central School, which is the school district I'm in. So I recall that, whether it's accurate or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. During that time period, there was a, um, I was on the board for a long time, but I was one of only two people on the board who did not have blood relation who was developmentally disabled. In other words, it was all family members. Yeah. Uh, which was good and bad in the sense that, one sense, as we grew bigger and it became a little more uh, challenging financially in, to understand it and the governance aspect of it and being mm -hmm. a board and at the same time being concerned about your family members as a, well, other board members. Yes. Did, did you get any sense of that at all in, from, from at, at your, in your role of that I don't, it wasn't a stressful dynamic, but it was a dynamic. You know, not really at the Resource Center. I do recall we used to have uh, meetings with some of the executive directors around the state. And I remember one time uh, the executive director of Erie County, New York, um, ARC, saying about how some of her board members would be more focused on whether they made a peanut butter sandwich for one of the clients or not. Um, but I don't recall that being a big deal. Um, but again, I wasn't really in the boardroom, so, um, but it was not as far as the finance committee. John Real. Yes, I wondered if you were gonna mention oh, him. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. I think he was like 90 years old when I started, wasn't he? <laughs> he was up there. Yep. Um, the, what I remember are a couple of things about him, and that is that as soon as I got hired, um, he like pulled me into a room and told me that if there was ever any problem that I was to come directly to him about it. It's like, okay, I, mean, I wasn't really expecting there to be any problems, but, um, but he was on the finance committee and he, um, I felt he was a very strong supporter of mine, so I really appreciated him. But he had a great sense of humor, you know. I don't remember some of the things he said, but, you know, he was, you know, you knew that he was a very wise and experienced person, and I felt fortunate to be able to have someone of that caliber on the finance committee and supporting me. John uh, was the other person who did not have blood relatives on oh. the board, so John and I, so... We were, I was the young lawyer kid, yeah. and he was the older Irishman uh, with an Irish sense of humor, but also uh, he didn't suffer fools lately. No, I, didn't. I wouldn't see him doing that, yeah. And, but he loved, he loved Michael. He did. And I, I'll just I give him full credit for us owning that building on Jones and Gifford. Because you, you may or may not recall, we were leasing it sort of a floor at a time with an option to purchase. First floor, and then somehow we, we got to pay that, treatment paid up that down, the and we got to the floor. second floor, and then the third floor, then the back building. So it's sort of a, kind of a quasi condominiumized till we ultimately owned the thing. Because we couldn't afford it. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if that was part of your remembrance of all that, but um, it was John who was creative enough, and Mike, yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Essentially, we're yeah. paying it out of state proceeds. Yeah. I don't really have much recollection of that. I do remember that we were opening programs on those various levels, but I didn't remember that. When we got into Allied Industries, mm -hmm. which was a really a for-profit organization, yeah. uh, out of a not-for-profit Shell, um, what was your reaction? Like, oh my gosh, we're in the manufacturing all of a sudden. Tom McConnell, that's a name I didn't mention yes. before. Okay, well, um, again, I think 
I think the beauty of being a really naive person, which I was at that time, was that when there was a new thing, I was more like, oh, all right, we'll do it, versus having enough experience to go, do we have any idea what a hassle this is going to be? So, I mean, Tom was um, very proficient, obviously, in manufacturing and knew his stuff inside out and backwards. And so uh, I w there was no concern about that. I mean, I think there was always a sense of excitement and, uh, you know, new opportunities presenting themselves um, that was always presented in such a positive way that I guess I never really thought that much about it other than, okay, now we need to have a new accounting system to figure out how to separate that from the sheltered workshop and, mm -hmm. you know, but, yeah, that, that was it. There was an early time period where we, uh, the Resource Center, leased property from individuals. For homes? You're, yeah, you homes, about group, group, yeah, group homes type things. Yeah. And seemingly, bang, bang, uh, those landlords f defaulted. And all of a sudden, our leases with a defaulting landlord to the banks were under now subject to foreclosure. And I can remember on a moment's notice because it was on the eve of a foreclosure sale where we might have to, somebody buys it, and we might have to get out. It's on 5th Street or 4th Street here. That Mike called and said, let's create a for-profit corporation called Chautauqua Rehabilitation Facilities Corp. I forgot about that. Yeah. So I really did forget about that. Chautauqua Rehab was born out of pure necessity. Yeah. So we created it overnight. We then cut a deal with Northwest Bank, Chuck Hanna, and we're, go ahead, foreclose, but we want to stay there, and we'll actually buy it from you, and then you will mortgage it back to you. And that's when Rebecca Brummagen has to come in and figure out the economics, where we can pay the taxes and mm -hmm. pay, pay the mortgage, et cetera. And shortly thereafter, there was a second one, like within two months, which then led to Chautauqua Rehab uh, ultimately buying a lot of real estate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Under kind of, not necessarily under the gun of a foreclosure. But do you remember setting that up? I mean, do you remember seeing, remember that time? I, I had no recollection of it until you mention it right now. And uh, no, not really. <laughs> Just We had to, and, and this may, you may have left by then, but we... Uh, got into a little bit of a political, with the department, again, I don't know which the alphabet soup was, uh, mental health, let's say, uh, where they reimbursed us. They were always reimbursing it because it was Chautauqua Rehabilitation Facilities Corp. Though owned by the Resource Center, it was a for-profit, right. leasing to a not-for-profit, we got appraisals, so allegedly arm's length. Yeah. And we got so real good. estate taxes reimbursed by the state, which then we could pay to the city. Mm -hmm. And that was good. Yeah, That was one of our big bullet points of telling the city we're worthy. As the citizens of Chautauqua County, we're worthy because we're paying taxes. And then one day they stopped. The state said, because you have a common owner, the resource center, you know, owns this subsidiary, if you will, and then they lease it, even though it's arm's length, even though it's, if it was owned by anybody else, like Milt Battler, it would have been okay. But since we owned it, we had to then make a critical decision about putting everything in a not-for-profit organization and not paying taxes. Do you I remember that? That might have been after me. Okay. I just don't, I don't recall that okay. at all. You, well, you would have. It was a pretty tough decision oh, to okay. tell, explain that to the city. Yeah. Well, that, was Paul there then? Yeah, it must have been. Because Paul was there when you were there, right? Did Paul come For a in? short time, like yeah. six months, okay. something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, it must have Nine been. months, something like that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, that was that was somewhat of a, uh, a traumatic time. The other thing, I was, when Steve was uh, interviewing me, and for the camera, Steve's off camera making notes, um, he, he kind of came in uh, asking me about what was the reputation of the resource center in the early days, at least of my involvement and, and yours as well, vis-a-vis -vis the community. I, I told him that I felt that uh, 
uh, I felt like we had a reputation of kind of serving the, hate to use the term, the unwashed. The, we just didn't have a positive, it was developmentally disabled people, they have, the mentally retarded was the term used at the time, and therefore not treated, at least in uh, polite circles, in, uh, as a serious economic engine. Do you, do you remember much about that at the time? Do you remember kind of the sense of it? Well, I th a little bit. Um, I think for me, thinking about the fact that the Resource Center and Michael Raymond were intertwined. And I think there was some complexity surrounding him as a person mm -hmm. and whether or not he was a good leader or was leading things effectively or whatever. Um, and so I think that there was sometimes a, sort of a tinge of a problem or whatever, a potential problem. I mean, I used to have people say to me, I can't believe you work for Michael Raymond. And it's like, well, yeah, I, I do. Well, how's that to work for him? And I said, well, it's okay, you know? And, and, and I would always say, well, he loves, you know, he loves the clients and he has done so much for them, you know? But, you know, he was kind of out there, as you know, and so sometimes I think our reputation was kind of tied together with him as a person. As far as the work that we did in our mission, um, I think the negativity came in when we were going to open up a new home or something in a neighborhood. And then people were concerned about having us as their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that was a fairly significant hurdle to overcome. Um, but I think once we were settled in, then some of those issues would die down. They wouldn't be quite as concerned. So I think the community at large probably didn't have that great of an understanding of the clientele and that it, there was really nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think there's, you know, when you think about, you mentioned the Willowbrook Wars and stuff. When you think about um, the fact that especially, I'll use myself as an example, before I went to the Resource Center, I had only seen one person who was mentally retarded in my life. And that I, he lived in our small town. I didn't even know he existed. His mother was a seamstress. My mom asked me to go pick something up at their house, and I went to the house, and there was somebody standing behind the drapes looking out. And I went home and I said to my mother, there was somebody standing behind the drapes. She goes, oh, that was Jerry. And I, well, I didn't know there was a Jerry. So if you think about going from people being institutionalized and separated from us as a society to all of a sudden a change in philosophy and bringing them into the community, I would say the general public probably didn't have a very good understanding of who the people are and you know what their skills are, what they, how they can enhance our community, but instead there was probably a level of fear about that, which I'm hoping that over the last few decades has reduced. Um, probably could never eliminate, I wish we could, um, but it would be, in my mind, a little understandable that it was a new experience for people in the community, so it might be difficult for them to really comprehend how meaningful it was to get people out of institutions and to have, a, you know, again, a more meaningful life. Fortunately, the state legislature is uh, kind of a, in the wake of the Willowbrook decree, passed some zoning legislation, which even though a group home by definition was not permitted, but they, there was an ex statutory exemption if you met a couple criteria, and that's what we used. And I don't know how many public hearings I went to. And I bet you went to a lot. A lot. And, oh, I mean, uh, we opened a lot of things. We so. opened a lot of things, and uh, the process was always kind of the same, where you go in, there'd be 100 people, you know, grousing, and, and I'd, I'd make my pitch, and uh, Michael, and whoever else was there, and, um, and ultimately we'd have a second public hearing. The supervisors were always very good, because they knew that if we had to go to court, because we had built our case, we will win. Yeah. 
but we're gonna win. But that's not the best way to go. So the supervisors were always good at, let's have a bunch of public hearings. And the second one, 25 people show up. Third one, when they were gonna take action, two people would show up. And obviously, Politically very wise. Oh, it, was, it, it was brilliant because they, they kind of used that format. It was, uh, so therefore I attended a lot of hearings and that's how that happened. And, and I met, a, a, since our last meeting, Steve, I, I've been struggling with the name of it. There's a particular name of that law, which is a, a group home permissive law. And there's, if, if, as long as you check a few boxes, you're, you're gonna be fine. Um, so you're there, do you, do you remember any specific highlights? I know Governor Cuomo came here. That was a big deal, yeah, yeah, when he came. Right. Yeah, that was a very big deal. And that was over something that did not materialize. Right, was that Harrison? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking it might be. And yeah. he came in and um, uh, we, did, we had a meeting at the city hall. He flew in, helicopter. Flew. Yep, mm -hmm. big deal. Big it deal. was. And... Um, what do you remember about Harrison Industries? Steve was asking me, and I was kind Dear. of doing, I, I kind of gave him an answer, but I'm not sure it was correct. Well, tell me what answer you gave him, because that might spark something. Okay, well, the answer I gave, it was a, a, a number of buildings we, were, we had under contract on Harrison Street, including Lundquist Hardware. Okay. And so we would secured the sites. And I forget what we were going to make there, but it was based on a contract. It was a government contract, I believe. And it was a big one. It was going to be an extension of Allied Industries, right? Right. And was it going to be like the mosquito nets and that kind of thing? Well, or I, I, I don't, that I don't recall, but it was, it was definitely, it was called Harrison Industries, Inc. Yeah. There, we, the governor was all guns a-blazing, we were guns a-blazing, but that underlying contract fell apart. And I, do, you have, do you have any recollection of that at all? No, I don't. I mean... I should, I guess, and probably tonight when I go home and mull it over, I'll feel like, oh yeah, this is what happened, but no. We'll stick with my answer then. <laughs> yeah, you're always right, Greg. <laughs> no, no. You're always, it's only the finance person would actually know if there's anything there. Uh, yeah, so that, that, was, that was a big deal. And we got a lot of real positive publicity mm -hmm. during that time period. Yeah. Uh, any, anything as we, we've been talking along here, sparking some, some, some memories, uh, incidents, home uh, purchases, anything that was sort of saying, Greg, do you remember the time that such and such occurred? Well, one of the things that I was thinking about that I've kind of carried with me all these years was, and I don't know if you would even know it, but at the time, we were awarded the largest appeal in New York State history. Do you remember that at all? No. So what happened was that New York State decided to change the rate setting methodology. See, this is accounting stuff, so nobody knew about well, it. Well, then we know, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they decided to change the rate setting methodology for group homes. And when they did that, um, you know, it was like complete overhaul. Um, I reviewed all the, the stuff and I kept thinking, they have something in here that's flawed. They, they have a loophole that they didn't realize. So I submitted an appeal and then I went to all these finance director meetings and I told everybody, I submitted an appeal on that rate setting. You guys need to do this. No one else in the state did it. And because they close an appeal after 18 months, then they, I never heard one word from them until 18 months was over. And mm -hmm. after 18 months, they sent us a check for $800,000. Wow. I was flabbergasted, floored, thrilled. Michael bought me a briefcase, and I still <laughs> have it to this day. And it is the skinniest little briefcase you could possibly imagine. You might be able to fit 20 sheets of paper in it, but I just... When I see that briefcase, I think, you know, that was such a cool thing, you know. So that was one of the highlights, I think, for me personally sure. as an accountant. I think also um, there was a time when, uh, you know how the state will do things and they'll decide, oh, this group of people need to get pay increases, but not these, this group of people. And it was like, I think it was residential employees that were going to be getting this bump, 3%, 4%, who knows what it was. And 
Michael says, well, we just need to give the residential employees this increase. And I said, oh, Michael, <laughs> I mean, yes, we do need to do that, but could I take a look at it? Yeah, I did. So then we took a look at it, and we figured out a way of changing the pay scale so that everyone was getting the same thing. We were complying with the requirements of the state. But, um, you know, those were, I guess, some of the, you know, back office decisions that were made that we tried to be as supportive as we could, knowing that you never know what the next thing is going to be that the state is going to give you, so. But can I tell you one thing about the computer that was donated please, to us? Please, please. From Jamestown somebody or other. We were at, we were at um, Second Street and downstairs, there was a whole section that was like storage, very big and open. And um, one day, Michael comes in and says to me, we had a computer donated to us. Oh, okay, and they delivered it, and it was enormous. It took up the entire storage area. And the operating system was $2,000 a month to <laughs> run this. And it had the capacity of 10K. Oh, okay. So that was probably around 1985 because I had an IBM on my, you know, on my desk, and I think I got it in 1985, and it had 512K. So I went into Michael, and I said to him, Michael, that computer that we just accepted that's taking up all that room, it's 10K. I said, my little one on my desk is 512K. And he goes, no, that couldn't be. It must be 10,000 of those Ks. So it's like, no, it was, that one is not 10,000 of those Ks. It's 10K. So we, we never used that computer that was donated to us. But that's just, you know, he did so many things on a whim, you know, because someone donated something to us or whatever. But as far as he was concerned, he thought that was something that would be very valuable. Uh, no, it wasn't. How about a houseboat we got? Oh, please. You, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Al B. Miller. I didn't even, are you kidding me? She <laughs> brought it up, I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. We do know what was on his hat, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But if you stop and think <laughs> about it. I'll tell you the back story later. It's, okay. it's unbelievable. You yes, just said. I'm sure it is. But the beauty of the situation was that people who use wheelchairs yeah. could get onto that boat yeah. and go out and enjoy the lake. And so at the heart of whatever we were doing, there was something that was inherently yeah. good. It might not pass the sniff test in terms of the community <laughs> or whatever, but it, it was... It was a great thing at one level, it sure was. I don't know if you were on, I was telling Steve along those lines, we had the houseboat, Al B. Miller, that whole backstory, and uh, we had one afternoon, we had a board meeting on that boat, Okay. and we, we sent off from Grenz, <laughs> okay. we went off, because yep. we were going to go up the Shadowquin. Yep. Well, unfortunately, as we launched off, and uh, Captain Al, Captain Al was in charge, mm -hmm. it just... <laughs> Just, it wouldn't start. So the river flows this way. Yeah. And we're getting closer and closer <laughs> to the bridge abutments <laughs> and all our grand plans, you know, of having a keg and all this food yeah. that had been catered out there. All of a sudden, like, oh, my God. So finally it started just within, as we were ready to kind of go jerry-rig our way through that uh, uh, bridge abutment there. But yeah, that was Captain L. <laughs> Yeah, and that was you. <laughs> There's nobody else. <laughs> it was you. And uh, I'll, I'll just conclude the story because probably Rebecca's behind it. But there was an event. We went to Moonbrook, and it was a, we honored somebody. I don't know what it was. And uh, somebody came up and gave me a football card of Al B. Miller framed up and gave it to me. I think I was probably the MC. you know, one of those things that I didn't know what was coming. Yeah. And because they had to make fun of this, that I had, uh, she's, she's really barely, she's not letting up on it, is she, Steve? Because <laughs> I, I was telling him that for all my time and, and maybe some influence, but I never, 
ever took advantage of whatever position I had vis-a-vis -vis Mike, except once. L.B. Once. Miller. <laughs> That's the only one I remember. Well, yeah, I can't wait for <laughs> Piat's tomorrow. It'll yeah, come out of nowhere. Oh, yeah. He'll, oh, he'll have more of a scoop than he'll Dan kill, Yeah, I know. But funny, I'll, why did you bring that up? Anyways, L.B. Hey, Miller. He brought up the houseboat. I subsequently, by the way, I interviewed him. L.B. Miller? Yeah. Uh, he was at Dunkirk because he's a Buffalo Bills, all-time yeah. center. And, and I, uh, uh, he was at a dinner with, for Van Miller, and I interviewed him. I interviewed Al B. Miller, which I was always hoping against hope that with his employment here, we could have Al bring all of his Buffalo Bills buddies down to play a golf tournament, yeah. you know, make lots of money. It never happened. Was he a Syracuse University guy? Yes, I thought big so. wrestler, big yeah. all-American wrestler. I digress. I digress. Yikes. Um, other stories. Other stories. Hmm. Was it during your time period that we did the Jamestown Expos thing, where we were the season ticket sales people? We had uh, um, Ann Farrell. Uh, was was Ann there at the time? No. She, she was Mike's assistant. We did the wrestling things. Do you remember? There was like yeah. some. We brought in pro wrestlers. I or forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> the way we did the payout was in cash. And so I had to have the cash and give it to them. And that wrestling event was the same night as one of my son's basketball games in Clymer or someplace. So I told Michael, I can't be there until, let's say, 9.30. You know, who knows? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's no problem. So the traffic is coming out of JCC on that upper level. I'm trying to go this way. And they were taking up. All of them. I finally get in there, and the wrestlers are like, "Are you Rebecca Brummagen?" I'm like, "Yes, we have been waiting for you." It was like, "So sorry, you know." But uh, yeah, that's all I remember about that wrestling event was that uh, wasn't there the moment they wanted to get their money. So that was now cool. that's one that's. I bet you don't even know about that, did you? I didn't start till '93, but yeah. I was doing a lot of research. Did you find anything about the wrestling yes. event? I don't know if we held it. JCC. Yeah, um, one time. I don't know if we I held it saw twice. One reference oh, to okay. It, but this was, you know, this is what the WWE is now. This yeah. was them 30 years ago before they got real big. Yes. Yeah, we were. Uh, everybody was trying to do something a little bit different to raise some money and to raise consciousness and yeah. raise awareness. And in the early days. Uh, Raising a, a positive consciousness was part of the goal of the board was, to, and to get st even staff members involved in uh, community affairs. You know, it could be the uh, fraternal organizations. It could be, you know, being involved in public, you know, affairs or whatever. It was just to get the employees out. And I don't know if you remember the crazy finance committee idea uh, that Merrill Rosen had that we were gonna pay everybody in $2 bills for a month, no, and which would then- I was not there, I can assure you. <laughs> Please tell me it was after 1989, because- Well, it clearly didn't make it, it, make, it didn't reality. Now, I do not remember that at all. A little known fact that the law, and still is, that you are required to pay in cash, your payroll. But you can apply for a waiver, which everybody does. Of course, nobody pays really cash. But Merrill's idea was to get everybody uh, to draw attention to the economic benefit of the resource center, its number of employees, was at least for one month period, so it'd be like two payrolls, uh, we would pay everybody in cash and there'd be $2 bills. So that every, you know, you're buying stuff and everything's $2 because it's gonna, people will talk. It's, it was a brilliant idea. Then my job as the attorney was one, is it legal? Yes. Two, can you convince banks to do that? Like who's got that All many $2 bills? And ultimately, pragmatically fell apart. But um, I remember whoever was there, probably in your stead, saying, really? <laughs> Mm. The logistics were too great. So clearly she didn't. She would have remembered that. I think I would have remembered that remember one. That. So there was a time then where, where uh, you chose to go elsewhere. 
-hmm. How did that work? How did, how did that opportunity present itself? Well, as I mentioned it, toward the very beginning, you know, my focus for my career was accounting, and I, and I loved it. I mean, I've never met an accountant I don't like. So, um, but it really broadened my horizon to be at the Resource Center, and I really felt maybe a simpatico toward people with special needs. And so I remember before Michael left, I said to him one day, I said, Michael, you know, someday I really want to be an executive director of an agency. And he's like, oh, okay, good, you know, whatever. But um, so I kind of had that as sort of my next career step in mind for a couple of years. Um, because he was actually gone a couple of years, I think, before I mm -hmm. moved on. And then, um, you know, so I was kind of chatting up about it with my husband, you know, someday I'd like to do that. And so one day I said to him, you know, I was kind of thinking there might be something in the newspaper for me today, the Erie Times News, um, like an executive director position. I said, but I didn't see anything. And he said to me, there was an executive director position in there for the Erie County Crippled Children's Society. And I said, there was? And so we pulled it back out. And um, the, like the deadline was like in two days or something. So on my dot matrix printer, because I didn't have a resume, I typed something up and sent it in to them. And uh, it really, I think, was sort of the culmination of what I'd had at the Resource Center and to be able to take it to a new level, which is the reason I think why I was at what became the Achievement Center there mm -hmm. uh, for 28 years, because um, I had that wonderful background at the Resource Center. What did the, because you, you grew that agency terrifically. Well, I didn't, but I mean, I was there with people well, as we grew it together. It, it, yeah, I know. You're being polite, but no. it's it's a lot of, a lot of people. But did did the influence of uh, kind of the expansiveness of a Mike Raymond did did that play at all in your mindset of you know seeing the Achievement Center all of a sudden it became multi counties? I mean, it was not yeah. Just we here. we went from when I started at the agency we had 30 employees. When I left, we had 300, which mm. I think was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and. Um, you know, we really did expand out into mental health for kids and, you know, a lot of trauma stuff. I mean, it was very rewarding for me, you know. Um, but talking about Michael and, you know, the thing about Michael is you never had to really ask where his heart was um, because it always was with the clients. And I always felt that when I moved on, that my heart was always that of a parent. So um, I, I remember when I first started at the Achievement Center, Erie County Crippled Children's Center, blah, 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 and Learning Disability Center. Not that that was a lot of mouthful. But I remember one of, I was a physical therapist, saying something about the MBA who runs the agency. And I was devastated by that. Because, yeah, I have an MBA. But that's to support the clinical work. And so, um, and I thought, oh, that's how I'm being viewed. I'm being viewed as the MBA who runs the agency. Hmm. Um, and so I think that over the years, um, you know, I was able to sort of convey that message of carrying the heart of a parent with me. And if I could give you one example of that, as we were... Um, had grown the agency substantially, there was a particular program called Wraparound. Um, it's behavioral health services that is for the top 1% uh, most difficult children in the county. And uh, there was a process called gatekeeping where about 13 agencies would come together and they would review cases. I can't even believe that they did this, but you know, we did it and we all thought it was okay and um, would review cases and decide which agency would get them. And one day I got a phone call from the person who convened the gatekeeping process, and she said to me, Rebecca, I have a problem. I said, well, what's the problem? She said, agencies are bringing cases, but they won't take the most difficult ones because they don't feel there's enough reimbursement. 
and they just don't want to have those difficult cases. And I said, well, it's very simple. You turn to the representative from the Achievement Center, and you say, Rebecca says you'll take this case. And that's how we grew the program from mm -hmm. like 10 or 12 kids to like 300 kids. And let me tell you, when my staff would come back with eight or 10 new referrals for the week, and they would be like, how are we going to staff these? I would be like, well, I don't know, but we're going to figure it out, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And that's how we grew the program. And that's actually how we started having what I consider to be the premier autism services in Erie County, and we're able to attract some really high-level um, behavioral specialists and, and supervisors is because, again, we just took whatever clients no one else would take. Mm -hmm. So that's what Michael would have done, right? right. That's what he did. And he did. Uh, did you follow Michael after he left and went to Connecticut? One time. <laughs> Kay and I went to did Connecticut. You? We did. Yes, she needed to go to a Mets game. So we <laughs> went to Connecticut to see um, Michael. And the objective there, when Michael invited us, was for me to meet with the financial staff. And Kay was, I don't know, just going along or whatever. So we took the train um, and went to the Mets game, it was freezing cold, it was like early April. Um, but I remember meeting with, <laughs> with like whoever the controller or CFO was, and she said to me, how do you deal with him? And I said, well, it's really pretty simple. First of all, don't ever do anything that he asks you to do if it is not legal or it's not you know, an ethical thing to do or it doesn't make sense to do, don't ever yield to him regarding that. But always tell him that you'll work with him on it. So just be very positive with him, but you know, stick to your ethical guns and don't let him, with his you know, conceptualization of how something should work, um, overstep any boundaries. So, oh, okay. <laughs> that was about it. So, I was telling Steve that one of the things Marty Idzik, you may remember, may or may bit. not remember Marty. He was a little bit. He was, was he on the board also? Or? No, no, he just, was just he was a an partner attorney with you, right? He did yeah. a lot of the labor stuff. Yeah. But we would call Michael on a Friday night, or in Friday afternoon. In Connecticut. Now you're talking. He was about in Connecticut. Okay. For no other reason than to have him laugh, to get him to laugh, because once. That his, he started laughing, we laughed. He did. Because it was contagious. It was. Uh, I don't know if anybody who was able to do that so effectively when he had that Cheshire cat grin and just yeah. started laughing. Well, uh, shall I on tape talk about sure. anything with his personal oh, life? Oh, why not? Okay. And I'll set the stage. As, and for those who have asked, and Steve did, you know, to me, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, Michael Raymond was a professional genius. He was. Professional he was. genius. With I agree with you wholeheartedly. A very complicated private life. Yeah. But always uh, seemed to find the fun in something and very oh. uplifting. Um, and um, now I would question how ethical this was, uh, but. Um, he had, you know, these meetings with these executive directors from all these different agencies um, regularly. I don't know if they were monthly or bimonthly or whatever. And one time he decided he would try to talk them into have a meeting in the Bahamas. Do you know about this? <laughs> no. You don't even know about this. So he talked them into it. it like the Cat County guy, you know, Rochester, Monroe oh. County, all these people. So he talked them into having one of their monthly meetings in the Bahamas. So he was telling me about this, and I said, well, Michael, what's your agenda? He goes, I, you know, I don't know. And I said, well, how about that you have them send all their financial statements to me, I'll analyze their financial statements, and then I'll do a presentation on how they look, you know, and how they compare and who is what, and what. he thought that was a great idea. So my husband and I went to the Bahamas. No kidding. Yes, with Michael 
and a girlfriend of his from Shocking. New York City. Yeah, I know, you're shocked. But, you know, somebody we'd never met or anything like that. But you don't mind if I tell the rest of this? No, line? please, please. Okay. So, anyway, had an okay time in the Bahamas or whatever. And I went to do this presentation. And, like, nobody could, they could care less. They didn't want, they didn't want to. Yeah. So I, I think I just ended up sending it to them. But the woman that he was with at that time was a teacher in New York City, and um, she had called in sick, let's say on Friday or something, and then like let's say Monday was a holiday or something, and then we were coming back on Tuesday, or Monday night or something. So um, we were flying back from the Bahamas, the four of us, and there was a snowstorm, and we couldn't get into New York. And she was like crazy wild about the fact, I have to be in school tomorrow. I have to be in school. I took that day off. We had this. I can't like miss school. So we flew to Philadelphia because the Philadelphia airport was open. And we had to figure out a way to get to New York. So back then, the ATMs, I think they would dispense $100, maybe $200 at a time. And so I think Michael went to the ATM and got $100. We went to the ATM and got $100, and we got a cab for $225, <laughs> who drove us from the Philadelphia airport to New York. And then, uh, of course, on the way, Michael had him stop at a beer distributor so we could get you know, a couple six packs of beer or whatever. Um, and then, um, yeah. So she got back to New York in time, and then we must have flown out you know, later on, or, I mean, I don't remember the last leg of the flight, except it was just the three of us, Dennis and Michael and me. And Michael had gone into the restroom, and he came out with, oh, Craig, I shouldn't be telling you this, a red clown nose, <laughs> and then he had it on him. So Dennis and I were sitting in the plane. Michael was sitting behind us. We had one of those little commuter planes. And Michael was saying things like pretending he didn't know us. And he was saying, ma'am, I just have a question. Would you like to wear this red nose or something? He was just silly. You know, I mean, for an adult, he just liked to have fun, and he was just silly. So I don't know. It's just a cute little story. Well, not, not quite the same, but when we went to his funeral. We Which I couldn't make. Yeah, we, a bunch of us flew out to New York and then took a cab to Connecticut and, and then came back. And when we were in the airport, that's when the entire eastern seaboard lost electricity. Oh. It was one of those days that yeah. nothing. So therefore, no flights at all going out of New York. And our cars had been in Buffalo because we drove, everybody drove separately mm -hmm. to Buffalo. So we rented a car and it was, it was, I'm trying to think of the people who were in there. I think it was Bender and Kay, of course, and myself. And so we, five, of us, five of us jumped in this car and drove from you know, New York from City New York to, to Buffalo, Buffalo in the middle of the night. I mean, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. And honestly, for seven hours, we never laughed so much because we were just reminiscing about Michael. Stories. All the Michael stories that you could never probably repeat. Yeah. at least without the statute of limitations running. And it was just a, a wonderful time, even though we're driving 4 o'clock in the morning. Crazy, but uh, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, that was, that was, cool. that was a moment. That was a moment. Uh, so what's the, what's the question? You drove in here from all the way from Finley Lake today. Oh, it's such a long ways. It you is. Know? It, it is. really is. It takes, you know, it takes almost a half an hour. You know, it's a big deal. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so get you uh, the town of Minus supervisor here at the Jackson Center. Well, I have, you know, one of my granddaughters lives in Jamestown with her, th she and her husband with their three children. So I have three great grandchildren here in town, um, but they're moving to Ripley here in a couple of months. Where are they? But, yeah. What's the question you expected I was going to ask you that I haven't asked you? Because you got a good 30 minutes to think about it. Yeah, I uh, see. Jeez. Maybe about some of the other directors? I don't know. Sure, tell me. Oh, I mean, I, 
I, do you know the time that they were very angry with me? No. It was early on in my tenure with, with the Resource Center, maybe a year into it. And I had decided that it was important to change from cash accounting to accrual accounting. And so I generated financial statements that were accrual accounting. And then I went around to each one and tried to explain it. Well, they kind of basically thought that that was like hogwash. So they went to Michael and basically said, she's got to go. She's got to go. She doesn't know what she's doing. She changed all the financial statements and stuff. And so Michael said, we're going to have a meeting and uh, you, you can explain this to people. And I said, Michael, are you throwing me to the wolves? He goes, no, no, no. They just want to, you know. So um, prior to that, I had been what I would consider to be somewhat lax in terms of implementing deadlines for people. Um, I couldn't get the statistics on time from you know, people, and I couldn't get this on time. So, um, so I went to the meeting, and you know, they basically said, we don't understand what these financial statements are. Why can't we just go back to the old ones? And so I listened to them, and I, um, it, it went fine. And then I said to him, now I need to tell you that one of the reasons why we're having struggles with the financial statements is because I'm not getting things timely. It's difficult for me to run payroll timely. It's difficult for me to do this. And uh, so I need you to do this. And they said, OK. And so after that, I think they thought that I was going to be angry with them, but I wasn't, you know? And I just treated them like I always did, and everything turned out to be fine. But I got one more story for you. Sure, please. OK. Um, when I first started, we had a bookkeeping machine. And the bookkeeping machine was used to do the client payroll and the staff payroll. And the bookkeeping machine sat in the office with the bookkeeper. And you know, this was a process that took a number of hours to take individual like employee record cards and put them in the bookkeeping machine. There was a certain way you had to flick your wrist to get it in and to come back out <laughs> and stuff. So we were doing this. And I believe that the client payroll maybe was weekly and the staff was like semi-monthly, something like that. So there was a lot of payroll. Well, what would happen is whenever we were running payroll, the breaker would uh, go off and the coffee machine would stop working. Oh. I made the mistake of saying, unplug the coffee machine. Do you know what coffee drinkers think when you unplug a coffee machine? <laughs> they didn't like that at all. But um, it didn't take long for Dave, what was his last name, the, the maintenance guy, Brink? Oh my gosh, yes, Dave it Brink. It didn't take long for him to come and install another electrical thing next to it so we could run the bookkeeping machine at the same time the coffee pot was on. Dave Brink. Hey, hey, hey. So what else you got left to do? I mean, you're now go going into, you've just announced today here at the Jackson Center for the first time that you're going to run again for supervisor for another four years. Yeah. This is it. This is the scoop. And um, uh, what, what else do you have that you would like to accomplish? Oh, well, a couple of things. I think I told you I'm, on, I'm back on Chautauqua Opportunities Board. Ah. I, I was chairperson before I left to go into Erie. Um, so I'm back on their board with Marie Karuba. Ah. Um, and I've been on the CODI board, the Chautauqua Opportunities for Development, since the inception of that. So that's like 15, 17 years, something like that. I'm on a lot of boards in Finley Lake, the Nature Center, the Community Center, the blah, 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 blah. Um, but recently, I went on the, which I mentioned to you, I went on the Community Music uh, Project uh, board last September-ish. Uh, because they needed some assistance with strategic planning and looking at their bylaws and that kind of stuff. And that's kind of my background. Um, so I went on that board. And then um, recently my oldest brother passed away in January. He was a musician. Um, he wasn't a person who put on a musician hat. He was a person that it was every fiber of his body was a musician. He wrote almost 200 songs, which, by the way, I'm cataloging. Um, and he was inducted into the Chautauqua County Music Hall of Fame in 2007. And I didn't realize that the Chautauqua County Music Hall of Fame has uh, 
sort of been inactive for a lot of years. And when I started to inquire about it, because we wanted to do a plaque in his memory uh, to put maybe at infinity, um, I realized, oh, they haven't been doing this. So I decided, well, it was time for me to spearhead this. So I spoke with Shane Hawkins at infinity and I said that I wanted to do this. And um, she had given me a tour of their place, which was, they're doing wonderful work. But I, the way they were doing plaques, it was like, not really OK. So I said to her, you know, I think I need to redo your waiting room for you. She goes, OK. <laughs> it's just so easy to deal with. I'm thinking, anybody else walks in and says, I'm going to redo your waiting room? OK. So, um, and then, because I'm on the CMP board, I'm not a musician. Um, I already told them on a scale of 1 to 1,000. What was your brother's name? T.C. Smith. He uh, had Col Colt, Colt Station, Station was his iconic band, but he was with Bumpy and the Sawmill Run. He was with Dark Tom Poker Club, uh, Coyote Joe, Nevada Smith, blah, 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 on and on. But um, so, you know, I am on the CMP board, and I told them when I joined the board, they asked me what my musical background was. I said, uh, well, um, I have a brother who's a musician, because he was still alive then. And I said, we listened to Fats Domino when I was growing up. <laughs> and uh, they laughed. And I told them, on a scale of one to a 1,000, as far as musical experience is concerned, I'm a two. So, uh, so I'm leading them through the strategic planning process. And we always laugh about it. I'm the person who doesn't know anything about music on there. Um, but. I said to them after one of our sessions, these have been all Zoom, I said, just in case you hear my name associated with the Chautauqua County Music Hall of Fame, I'm going to be doing this primarily because I, because I want to honor my brother. And I really think we have just incredible musicians in this county who have not been recognized. And uh, so we got off the meeting. and. Uh, Joe Brager, who's the general manager, talks to the board president and says, we want, we want that under our umbrella. We want the Music Hall of Fame under our umbrella. And I was like, OK, so I'm working on a proposal for that. So I'm working on that. And just I have a ton of stuff going on. Is there a list of members who were inducted into the? Shita? Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, uh, they only actually had it for three years, so there's 15 members slash groups. Of course, the 10,000 Maniacs were the first ones, which you would expect. Um, and there are a lot of names on there that I'm not familiar with. Um, but when I read the names to the people on the CMP board, they were pretty familiar with all of those names, or most of them anyway. So I'm very excited about this project. I think it's, it's fabulous and long overdue and obviously dormant until you've resuscitated it. Yes. My brother was a very modest person, very kind-hearted and modest person. So it really isn't like him to want to be somehow advanced above anybody else. And that's not my intention. And my intention isn't for this to be the T.C. Smith, you know, uh, Music Hall of Fame. It's for him to have his due like all the rest of the musicians that deserve to have their due. So you're growing up, your older brother is a musician, you're not? How does that work? Did you go to his concerts? Did you go, and did, were you, as, as you, in the family itself, was your brother, was, was he a budding musician when you were? 16, he got his first guitar. He taught himself how to play. He taught himself music. He never had music lessons. And yes, we used to sing Alley Oop. My sis younger sister and I, he would go, swing through the jungle like a and we go, Alley Oop, 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 and then he'd do the next line of it. So, I mean, music was always important in our house. And, you know, I took piano lessons, but I was crummy, you know. So, um, yeah. So you weren't the backup group like the Vandellas or anything like that? No, okay. I was not, <laughs> other than Alley Oop. Uh, so, no, he, he was uh, just a, a free spirit. And he and I, I, I think, you know, there's four in the family, and uh, I'm very connected with all of my siblings, but he and I, uh, philosophically, I think we're the most, well, I know we were the most connected yeah. with one another. Well, this has been great, Rebecca Brombridge. Thank you, Greg. Walk down memory lane. Thank you, lane. Steve, also. I hope, I hope you've learned something about... Did you have any questions, Steve? Yeah, the one thing yes. that popped to mind as, as you were talking, as the two of you were talking. Um, yeah. So when you came on board, uh, yeah. 
our administrative office and pretty much everything we did were all located in the building on Jones and Gifford Avenue, it which was. is now the Michael J. Raymond Center. Yes. But then in 83, the administrative offices moved down to Second Street. And yes. When you're at MJRC, the Jones and Gifford building, you've got the, all the, the staff, the administrative staff are there with the people who receive supports from yes. the resource. I'm just wondering how much of a change that was, how different it was to go from that environment where you're seeing the people we support every day to now being down at Second Street where they're not down there. Every I day. love being at Jones and Gifford. And I thought that made the biggest difference for me as a person. So it was hard to be separated from them. Um, two of the experiences that meant, th three experiences that meant the most to me was um, David Whiting. Do you remember David? Was, David. David Whiting, he was a client. Yes, right? yes, 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 yes. He was in an institution until he was 40 years old. And my office, when you go into Jones and Gifford and you go through the double doors to the left, uh, my office was the very first office, which was really great because sometimes people would accidentally come through there, you know. But David would come in every day, and it didn't matter who I was meeting with, my door closed or open or whatever. I could have, you know, it could be an auditor from the state, whatever. He would open the door and he would tell me the menu for the day. And he would say, we're having spaghetti today, and bread, and butter, and milk, and whatever. And it was like, it was wonderful, you know. So that was one thing. And then there was a client named Jim, and for some reason I can't think of his last name. He was a maintenance guy. And he was, um, you know, one of those soft on the inside, gruff on the outside kind of guys. And, um, you know, you didn't walk on his cafeteria floor after he mopped it, you know, you just didn't do that. But I was always going to him and asking him if I could borrow his measuring tape. Because as the agency grew, there was my office and there was the office next door that only uh, Gary... Um, Melquist. Like, yes, Gary Melquist was in there. That was all, and then there was two people, then there was three people. So I was always going and measuring um, how I could fit another desk in there. So I would go to Jimmy, it was Jimmy, and ask him for his measuring tape if I could borrow that. And uh, one day he brought me a measuring tape. And I still have that measuring uh. tape. And I've carried it, it's always been in my desk, no matter where I am. So that was one, those are two. But one other experience is, you know, after I acted like I never had any stress in my life at the Resource Center. There was some. Um, I had a particularly stressful day, one particular day, and I was, you know, doing one of these, mm, you know, what about this, what about, I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. I looked out the window, and there was a client, Anthony, and he had a dog with him. He had his um, dog with him, support dog. And as I was going, how am I going to handle this, blah, 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 I could see him standing outside, singing to himself, swaying back and forth. <laughs> I thought, all right, <laughs> somehow there's something here for me to learn about the fact that I just need to uh, kind of cool it with, you know, being stressed out about something. Because look at this guy, he's just enjoying himself, waiting for the bus. So, yeah, it meant a lot to me, Steve, to, to be able to be at Jones and Gifford with them. But, you know, again, I carried it with me you know, over to um, Second Street, but it wasn't the same. Other questions? Ed, this is your chance. No, I'm okay. Don't ask about, <laughs> don't ask about Al B. Miller. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Don't mention anything about me going to the Bahamas, okay? <laughs> that's new. I didn't know you that. You didn't so. know that, huh? No, yeah. I assumed that the end story was going to be that New York City a date was going to then apply for a job at the Resource Center. And oh, we, we have those we, stories, don't we? We do, we do. Kay yeah. had more of them, though. Oh, uh, she did. Like the time that I didn't know that a particular person was applying for the position. A, a position that, did we even have the position? But whatever, I just remember that Michael was back in his office in the, you know, the inner sanctum part of it with the conference table and stuff and he was talking to this woman and I needed to talk to him. You know, I mean, I, I had to get something. And so finally I just kind of rapped on the door and said, Michael, could I talk to you for a second? He said, yeah. So I went back and I had him sign stuff or whatever I needed from him. 
<laughs> and he says to me, uh, or he says to Karen, he says to her, oh, this is, you know, Rebecca Brummage, and she's the CFO. <laughs> Karen goes to him, oh, well, she's an important person, like that. And I said, Michael, am I an, am I an important person? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you are. I said, okay, well, thanks for that. <laughs> But I just remember she was like, oh, well, you're an important person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Those were the days. Those you just, were the days. You never think. quite knew. Um, well, thank you. This thank has been terrific. Thank you. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's one of my things is family history. I don't know if you know. I'm mm. a genealogist, and I do family history. And I do, I don't know if you know, I teach orals. Um, I used to, I haven't done it in a long time, oral history for um, the Geneal Genealogy Society in Erie. And I follow something called uh, Family Tales, Family Wisdom. And it's um, actually a psychotherapist from Manhattan who wrote this book about how to get elders to open up and tell stories of their lives. And it's a, a ten, he has 10 chapters, 10 sections that you do. And it's all based upon photographs. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, his mother was like over in Switzerland or something and she would come over each summer and he'd ask her to bring certain pictures. And then from that, she would uh, sit with her granddaughters and him and talk about things. So I've, I, I appreciate having my memory sort of sparked here today. Thank you for that. But. I'll tell you a story, but we'll do it off camera. We're, all, we're good, Ed. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So uh, along those lines, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've done a few interviews, and uh, I was permitted to uh, interview Andrew Young. Andrew Young. And civil rights leader. Uh, oh, okay. I'm uh, in Jamestown here and whatever. No, Andrew Young. He was at Chautauqua, and I... Okay. I got 20 minute access. You know, you got, you got, you, you, you know, ambassador, UN ambassador. I mean, you name it. He, he has a whole, but it's really that, you know, civil rights. He was the guy hanging with, you know, King and stuff. So, I know I only had a few minutes, so I got to rapid fire this whole interview. So I brought a, a at the Chautauqua bookstore. They had a deck of, essentially, civil rights baseball cards. Just cards. And so I bought it, five bucks. And I then, I kind of shuffled them and I hand, was making sure Andrew Young was the last card, you know. And so you I said, so clever. could you tell me who these guys are? And I'm, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. And so I then had a chance to interview Julian Bond, then Allegheny, cards. Again, Julian Bond being the last one because he picks the last one. He goes, well, what would you say about that guy? <laughs> and, uh, and it was just, just cute. And then finally, I had, remember, you probably don't know the name, but Robert Moses. He was another big civil rights guy. He was at Allegheny. And I handed him the, te the cards. And I got the camera going, and I, he's just looking at them. Quietly puts one here, one here, one here. I got my God, this is going to die. He's not going to talk. He's just simply not going to talk. So this went on for like five minutes. It was killing me. I didn't even know what to say. I didn't know how to fill in the void. He was just shuffling cards. And all of a sudden, he picked up the left side of the cards. He looked at them, redid re them, and said, okay, here's my life story. Boom, 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 boom. And, and his life story through the interaction of these cards. Wow. And he went on for like th half an hour giving his, essentially, autobiography of his civil rights movements in Mississippi and Alabama and dealing with, you know, Martin Luther King and, you know, all of these guys, you know. It was unbelievable. So basically, point is, back to the pictures, yeah. you know, it's a prompt. It is. And you got, you got choices when I do the what I do. Either you give them a visual prompt, you got to paint a picture, or throw something at them. Now, mm -hmm. if you throw something at them, it kind of... It, it, it upsets the flow. You know, like, could you describe this? Can you describe that? So it's, uh, it's an interesting play. I get it. Um, but it's, it's so critical when you talk to... I, I must have interviewed 300 World War II veterans. Wow. Yeah, and that was always the same thing. You had to kind of create a picture. Uh, 
and, and just know enough about World War II, because you don't know when you walk in, Europe, <laughs> yeah. Pacific. Right. Let's start there. I mean, fundamentally, which, yeah. what theater are we in? Or yeah. stateside. Yeah, or stateside. Yeah, you know, kind of, all right, let's get, now then, you, then your right brain or left brain is going to kick in and work your way through that. And uh, you kind of learn through just starting with, were you drafted or did you enlist? Mm -hmm. And then you work your way through boot camp. By that time, you're now kind of, your brain is engaged. And it's, it's, been, it's been an amazing thing. I've run out of people. So if there's anybody in Finley Lake that's 95 or 6, that's as young as they have to be. To, what do you mean that is as young as they have to be? The, to be live and, and World War II. I wonder if uh, Norman Neckers, I wonder if he is. So. Your job is to find out. Okay. Oh, you I've oh, you give me so many assignments, and I feel really guilty. There's one I've not done that I was supposed to do a long time ago. Who for was you. that? Kathy Lynch. Yeah, you didn't feel miserable. Yeah. So there, I'm now telling. Admitting. I'm admitting. Is that running? Still running it? <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> I I I'm I have pangs of guilt about oh, good, that. Good, good, good. May, may it always be. That I have pangs of guilt about what? Everything or just Kathy, Kathy Lynch? No, I'll get it done one of these days. I <laughs> promise you that. You know, when I go to Arizona, I don't pack clothes. I pack suitcases of work. Oh. And, I, and um, I'll have to put Kathy Lynch in there. Then I'll feel a lot better when I, well, when I get good. that done. Good, good, good. Well, and now, now Mr. Neckers, that would be good. If he's, he's... I don't know. I'll find out if he... Was in the war, I don't know. You know it's because it's been, we did start this in 2013, and there were a few. Um, I, have a, I have on my, the office, one name of one person left. Really? Because they're just 96. You're, That's it. That means you, get, you went in in 45. This was not the early part of the war. I mean, that you, you went in oh, right you at the Oh, you were one of the late ones to go in. The late ones to go in, and then now you're 96. So... Unless you're 100, you really were not in the early part of the war. Mm. There aren't many of those guys, men around. I mean, yeah. so uh, that, that's that been a fun project. Defenders of Freedom of, is the project, and a guy named Phil Zimmer who writes World War II magazine articles tags along with me, and he's looking for stories. That's so cool. And he's done a few of them, which have been nationally published. Very cool. Do you ever do um, any uh, allied troops that are here, you know, that are not U.S. soldiers? Like we had a gentleman from Denmark oh. that moved here. He's not alive anymore. But, no, you I... know, he, he was with the allied troops from Denmark, but then he moved here, someone like that. Well, do anybody. I did a, a guy who was in Warren, just died last year. He was a part of the Nazi youth group. Which was fascinating. Fascinating. You know, yeah, oh, sure, we studied Hitler, but it was essentially glorified Boy Scouts group until you got a certain age. And then, you know, you can learn to start military training. Interesting. But this is then, you know, this guy's down there in Youngsville, Pennsylvania. And it's a riveting story, which I then, what I do is I edit it and then find some footage that sort of goes with it to sort of put a, a mini documentary, which is then sent it to the family members and they they're, they go crazy. And for me, it's capturing a story, which is now, for all intents and purposes, of the 300, maybe five are still alive. Wow. Well, what you've done here at the Robert Jackson Center is incredible as well. Remind me, I'm going to give you some stuff to take back to a town of Minot so you okay. can sp splay it around. What it is, it's we just published this a few, a month or so ago through the Post Journal, it was um, Robert H. Jackson through the eyes of the Post Journal during the Nuremberg trial. Essentially, how did the Post Journal cover Jackson? Oh, that's cool. That's very yeah, cool. Yeah, it was a cool concept. We did it, actually had a guy uh, intern do it in 2006. We published it then, but we just republished it because it's the 75th anniversary. So I'll give you a, a stack of them. A few years ago, my husband and I took four of our granddaughters, they were all teenagers then, to uh, Los Angeles. And um, we, uh, they wanted, of course, to go on the 
open bus tour, you know? Sure. So we were on the open bus tour, and there's d these different places. Well, there is a Holocaust museum, very small, um, on the tour. So they, the girls wanted to do that. We, we went in. There's a whole section on Robert H. Jackson. Yeah, so that was kind of cool. And I'm like, girls, you've got to come here. You've got to learn about this. And like, uh-huh, yeah. But, um, yeah, that's very cool. When that was opened, they invited us to go out Oh, did there. they? And I didn't go, but Raleigh Kidder, who you may know, Raleigh, from, he was our executive director. He went with one his of his brother Bruce. Yeah, yeah. His Bruce's wife Charlene was my best friend. Oh, there you go. Growing up, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Raleigh and a Nuremberg prosecutor by the name of Whitney Harris flew in from St. Louis and Raleigh from here, and we're at that event. And of course, to have a Nuremberg prosecutor who was Jackson's right hand guy show up. So we got to be, we looked really good for just bringing somebody. Yeah. That's correct. Small world. Yeah. Well, don't feel any pressure about uh, a couple of things you're doing. Got to do, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> don't, got, don't give me any more assignments, okay? Until hey, I get look, and look, and look, and look. She had me come up and speak. I was a big time speaker at one of your events. Yes. Was it Memorial Day or Fourth of July? I forget what your big parade is up there. It's Memorial Day. Memorial Day, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Yeah. That was fun. So yeah, she uh, she called in all her chits and. Yeah, he came to do a presentation one time for our historical society, yes. and he told me that I owed him. So. Then he calls me up and tells me that what I owe him is that I have to analyze, or I have to research Tommy Leach, who was a baseball player who was in like the first World Series, who is a descendant of Alexander Finley from Finley Lake. And uh, yeah, so I did all that. My husband and I, we were down in Florida. We went to his, you know, yeah. the mausoleum kind of thing and stuff. And then, I ha it turns out then, because there's no family alive, who do you think had to go to the Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame and do the presentation on Tommy Leach? Me, you know, on, base, on baseball. Well, and she, she's not telling the story who got him in to the Hall of Fame. You know, we, had, we got them in because of your information. We got him in. Yeah. So he's there. So then, she did a great speech, and it's on YouTube. I filmed it for her. So, she, so I go up to give the speech. Jim Kelly is the guest speaker that night. I go up. They hand me the plaque or whatever. I put it on the podium. And then when it's ready, I'm ready to speak. I can't find my speech. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? I don't have my speech. Jim Kelly goes, it's under your plaque. I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jim Kelly saved my life that night. So I always liked him anyway, but that was like a great a, thing. She did a wonderful job. Wonderful. So.